Elementary School. Now this is this is in Ohio. It's not not here in Virginia. <laughs> um, he went to the Edinburgh Elementary School. During his school years, he would make four trips a day because he made money milking cows. First, he woke up early, dressed in chore clothes, and bicycled uphill two miles to milk cows. Then he came back home and changed into school clothes <clears throat> and went to school. After school, he became he would reverse the process. This resulted in eight miles of bicycling, rain, shine, or snow. During the winter, he wrapped furnace chains around his bicycle tires for traction. His calf muscles became very well developed and strong. Another way EJ would make money was by selling cucumbers. He sold them for three cents on the side of the road, and he would carry a salt shaker with him and sell the cucumbers to the workers who were working on building the road. E.J. was part of the first graduating class of Southeast High School in Ravenna, Ohio in 1951, when he was 18 years old. There were 63 graduates that year. He left Ohio to go to Washington Missionary College in Tacoma Park, Maryland, where he stayed for one and a half years. While he was in college, one of his friends took him up in a plane and showed him the Shenandoah Valley. E.J. fell in love with the place and knew that this is where he someday would live. After he left school, he worked in the area cutting pulpwood in the woods for Mr. Tucker. One afternoon, as he walked back to the shack he was staying in for the night, a bobcat on the, on the hill nearby screamed. And as E.J. said, my hair stood on end. The next morning, he made pancakes and went down to the creek to wash his utensils. While he was at the creek, cows came up to the camp and ate his pancakes. <laughs> Later, he would purchase the property on the same road. Uncle Sam decided that since E.J. was no longer attending college, he should be drafted into Uncle Sam's army on January 28, 1953. They sent him to Camp Pickett, Virginia, for boot camp. After finishing boot camp, they sent him to Texas for, for second basic training at Fort Sam Houston. Next, he shipped, they shipped him to the south side of Chicago, where he learned how to inspect food at the Meat and Dairy Hygiene School. The Army Medical Service, uh, Meat and Hygiene, oh, excuse me. Um, the Army Medical Service Meat and Hygiene School in Chicago graduated EJ along with 89 other inspectors that year. Seven of the graduates then went on to advanced veterinary medicine, Walker, Walter Reed Medical Center, Washington, D.C. On December 8 of that year, his youngest brother, brother, Ernest L., was born. For those of you keeping track, E.J. was 20 at the time. His father was 53 and his mother was 43. When he was on break from the meat and dairy hygiene school in the summer of 1954, he decided to go see a girl named Wanda Rose in Illinois. So he got on the bus, but the bus only took him part way. E.J. was so determined to see this girl that he walked the other 18 miles to Hinsdale. When he finally arrived there, he met a girl named Shirley and asked her for a drink of water. He then went on to see Wanda Rose, but she was not interested in him, <clears throat> so he came back and spent more time with Shirley. <laughs> All right, come on. 
This was June. Uh, they were engaged just, just one month later in July and married December 2, 1954, 11 days after Shirley's 16th birthday. E.J. took his new bride back to Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C., near Tacoma Park. Here is where he learned to be a mechanic. After he spent some time there, he was shipped out to Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah, where he poisoned a few sheep because the place was an environmental, mis mysterious place. Uh, the center, the test center was for chemical and biological defense, it was owned by the U.S. government. He spent the rest of his army time in Utah until he was honorably discharged in January of 1956. While there, someone hit his four-door station wagon and wrecked the car. He decided rather than let the car go to waste, he'd turn the car into a pickup truck. And so he did. Although discharged from the Army, he stayed in Utah until March 15, so they wouldn't have to move in the winter. By mid-March, thinking winter was now Behind them, they started out. On the way east, he and Shirley stopped in South Dakota, not aware of the extreme weather that could meet them there. They were caught in full-blown gale with 18 inches of snow and temperatures of minus 19 degrees. They couldn't leave until the weather cleared up. Leaving South Dakota, they came right here to Newmarket, Virginia, and he found a fella to work for. Mr. Charles Tucker. He worked for him a long while, mo mostly doing farm labor, something that E.J. would sometimes brag that he could stack hay six bales high, flat-footed, in the hay mow. Small hay bales measured 14 by 18 inches wide by 36 inches long and weighs 50 to, six po to 60 pounds. Other hay bales are larger. Six bales would have stacked up at least seven feet high. While he was in the market, he also worked for various other people, but later decided to go to Ohio, where he took a job working for his uncle Ted Metcalf. During the next several years in Ohio, he cut lots and lots of wood. Sometime, something else E.J was very proud of was making a tractor with two transmissions that he used to drag logs out of the woods while he was logging in Ohio. He sometimes had to stick a stake in the ground to see if it was moving. It was geared so low. While they lived in Ohio, Shirley became pregnant with their first son, Kenneth Jean Laughlin. E.J. loved Newmarket so much that they made the trip to have Kenny right here in town on May 15, 1957, on the anniversary of the Battle of Newmarket at the Hinkle House. Their second son, Jamie, or James Lee, was born on August 22, 1961 in Woodstock. Although most of the family still calls him Jamie, E.J. often called him Jimmy the family would move back to the area when it was time for the child to be born and go back to Ohio when it was safe to travel. E.J. and Shirley finally settled in Newmarket for good by the time Kenny started second grade. Anyone who knew E.J. knew that he preferred not to use his full name. One time his family from Ohio came to visit the Laughlins down here in Newmarket. They pulled off at one of the nearby houses to get directions. When they asked for where Elwin lived, the family replied that they didn't know any Elwin. The youngster, Everett, in the back seat then piped up and said to ask for E.J. Then the man at the house said, E.J.? Oh, he lives next door. 
The third son, Wayne Fred, was born on November 13, 1964. As the three boys grew, they decided to pray that the next baby would be a sister. Sure enough, their sister, Deborah Juanita, was born on January 23, 1967, also in Woodstock. Ten years later, or excuse me, ten years separated their oldest and youngest children. Debbie was adored by her three older brothers. When E.J. was working for Wallace Smith, milking cows and helping around the farm, they told him to paint the fence with creosote. He went out, grabbed a bucket of black goo sitting by the door, and painted the fence all day though he was puzzled when the cows started licking the fence. It turned out, since his smeller wasn't that good, he had picked up the wrong bucket. He had slathered the fence with molasses. <laughs> Later, when the Smith farm got a milking machine, E.J. showed his son, Kenny, the pumps that milked the cows. Young Kenny took the pump in his hand and proudly proclaimed, Flashlight. At that time, he worked for the Birches and the Smiths. He, worked proudly, pro he would proudly proclaim the Birches paid him 60 cents an hour with a meal, and the Smiths would pay him 75 cents an hour, but, they, but he had to carry his own lunch. His family then had to live on those wages. He started trucking in 1967, pulling trailer houses. He would drive from one coast to the other, picking up another delivery from the various de uh, destinations with hardly a run in the destination of home. When De Debbie was a baby, he was gone so long that when he returned, the little girl would cry, and Major the dog wouldn't let him in the house. His mother, Clara Ellen Self, passed away on January 14, 1979, in Ravenna, Ohio, at the age of 69. E.J. also worked at a wire factory making easels and stands for flower arrangements at funeral homes. When given the opportunity, he later bought the business, running it from an old factory building next to the railroad tracks in Shenandoah, Virginia. This old factory had grain silos and a lot more square footage than he needed for the business. A fire in the building caused some setbacks, but it did not put him out of business. At times, he would run the machines, fix them if they broke, take care of the inventory, and even deliver it up and down the Atlantic seacoast. He used to say, I make plastic casket plaques for people who didn't know they were going to need them. His father, Leslie, Fred Leslie, excuse me, passed away on August 19, 1986, in Ringgold, Georgia, at the age of 86, while living with E.J.'s sister, Phoebe. Twelve years later, the sister, Phoebe, died on October 19, 1998, in Ringgold, Georgia. At the age of 57, his brother, Austin, preceded him in death on, no, on November 13, 2009, in Davidson, Mecklenburg, North Carolina. Next, E.J. went back to trucking. He drove for various companies, including Freeman Trucking, his longest-running job. He retired from there at the age of 78 in 2011 because the owners sold the company. No one else wanted a 78-year-old trucker, despite the fact that he distributed appliance far and wide. He said he was too old, and the old trucker and the trucker insurance wouldn't cover a man after he was 70 years old. E.J. was an active member of the New Market Seventh-day Adventist Church in New Market, Virginia, right here where he served as a deacon. The head deacons often commented that if needed an extra deacon, he could always count on E.J. 
He also served as Sabbath school teacher and was much appreciated by the class members. In 2003, Yvonne Pichette began a ministry called Rock. It's, it's a, uh, over the years, even before his grandchildren attended Shenandoah Valley Academy, E.J. helped his wife as she became involved in the Rock Ministries, which is reaching our kids. Church members adopted teenagers from the New Market Seventh-day Adventist Church as well as from the academy. Starting with three students per year, now grown to five or more per year, Shirley and E.J. would stuff goodie bags with trinkets, candy, and other goodies each month. They are grandma and grandpa to end a stream of teenagers have, that hail from many places in the U.S. and the world. South America, Asian, African, and American grandchildren have grown to know and love them both. In 2014, E.J. decided to help another volunteer for the church by working with a cardboard ministry. This cardboard was recycled and the funds received were put into Pastor Buzz's flag cap ministry. When the other volunteer retired, Shirley joined him in his work. For the past four years, they had volunteered and put in time and effort and willingness into picking up and bailing cardboard. Over the years, they built the collection sites to approximately 26 local businesses. They then deliver it to the recycling place in Harrisonburg and collect the payment to be returned to the church. E.J. and Shirley were also part of ASSIST, where they worked with kids from SVA like Basam and Andrew. ASSIST pairs high school students with seniors to build relationships and mentor the teens. Whenever you saw E.J., he would always smile, and when you ask him how he was, he'd say, not bad for a kid, might not make it to, for a grown-up, and he'd laugh. What else could you do but laugh with him? He made an impact on everyone he met because he was ready to exact definition of hard work. He worked hand, he worked hard, including the day he suffered a stroke and was taken to the hospital. He appeared to rally during the first six days of the, uh, of the, of the hospital stay. He enjoyed telling his stories to the nurses and doctors. They all grew to know him and, and, and some of, of performances. One doctor even joined, joked that he had to leave now because he wanted to go out and buy a Ford. E.J. despised Fords. We knew he was not awake when he didn't uh, respond to that joke. He started to sleep more from December 16 onward. His sons, Kenny and Janet, Jamie, and their wives, his daughter, Debbie, and their husbands, as well as several grandkids, took turns staying with Shirley at the hospital. At the end of December 21, 19, 2018, in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the age of 85, E.J. passed peace, peacefully into the sleep from which Jesus will awaken him when he comes to take us home. As you can see, E.J. was a wonderful man. He had a beautiful life and was a hard worker and a faithful Christian. Now he's just sleeping, waiting for Jesus to awake him. He will surely be missed. Uh, let us all covenant together to meet him when Jesus comes. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> I've asked Bill and Pastor Reed if they would
just uh, use the microphones here, and the family is giving us an opportunity to remember EJ. So if you have something you'd like to share for the family to, to add to the stories that Bill has shared with us, just, uh, just raise your hand, and we'll take a few moments to, uh, to share together. Who'd like to go first? To Shirley, on behalf of Shirley and EJ, our son Reuben, who's not here, is grieving the loss of EJ because he mentioned it to us. And, you know, the things that he did for Reuben would bring him from and to work, at, just pick him up at our home and kind of put him, you know, in responsibility. Now Reuben's in college at uh, WAU, but I do attribute a lot of the things that EJ was doing with him, giving him a good work ethic and those things, because he, Reuben had lost one of the jobs he had prior to that in school, misbehaving. But EJ took him under his wing, and we're very grateful for the time that he spent with Reuben and also our family. My name's Ernie. I work with EJ in that wire factory. It must have been 35 years ago, 40. I didn't work there long. You worked there a week. You'd have to throw your clothes away. You get so greasy. But I moved away for about 30 years and came back into New Market. First, one of the first persons I ran into was EJ, and I uh, couldn't help but like him. If he had an enemy, it wasn't his fault, it was your fault. So everybody loved him. I was over at his house one day and he was stringing. He rigged up some type of uh, thing to catch his green beans to run up, and uh, pretty elaborate thing he had there, I'm sure it wouldn't have fell down, but the groundhogs were giving him a fit. I said, EJ, I can get rid of him for you pretty easy with my 22. And that was the wrong thing to say, because he wouldn't hurt a fly. So we continued to work on that, the instrument he had there to catch his green beans. And uh, he started singing this song. You can see this big, rough guy singing, I'm just a lonely tulip, I mean a, I'm a lonely little petunia in an onion patch. And I wished I had my phone camera on because I just melted your heart. I went back home and got on the internet to see if that was a real song. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, it's on there. He's, I think he said his granddaughter was singing that to him. But uh, we'll miss him. And uh, we, we love you, EJ, and we'll miss you. And Shirley, God bless you. Thank you. I'm, I'm Gerald, and I had the privilege of working with EJ somewhat. Uh, it, was, it was quite a joy to work with EJ because we hardly ever saw each other. Uh, we'd, we'd usually meet at a, a grocery warehouse or something like that. Ron, you've probably been out there with him too, haven't you? Um, EJ was a faithful driver for, for Freeman Trucking. Uh, I did the best I could. But uh, we'd get there and, and compare stories uh, about where we'd been and the troubles we'd had. Uh, anybody that knew E.J. very well probably worked with him. A lot of people work 20 or 30 years looking forward to retirement. I don't think E.J. ever planned on retiring. Uh, he and I put the company out of business, and uh, that, he had to retire then when the company <laughs> was sold. But he. 
he still kept working. He just changed, changed jobs. That's the only way he retired. I want to do the same thing. My name is uh, Joseph. Uh, we have a last name back here, Nathan. Uh, my son here, Andrew, uh, is a senior here at SW. Um, when we heard about um, EJ passing away, um, we, Andrew let us know about it, and he kind of choked. We asked if he would want to go for the memorial, and he said, sure, we would want to go. And so we drove in from Bellsville, Maryland, this afternoon to be here to meet with Shirley and the family. Um, when we think of EJ, you know, it just brings tears in, um, to our eyes. Every time we come to SVA to worship here at the sanctuary, EJ would be one of those who would actually reach out to us. Uh, we would be seated somewhere here, and he would come walking towards and reach out to us. At first, I didn't quite understand it, but then later, as I found out that EJ was very involved with the rock program, EJ and Shirley and Andrew was one of those rock students with EJ for several years and as we understand what um, the rock program is all about the little goodies that Andrew would receive the encouragement at work you know a little bit of um, I, I would say not a little bit but a lot of EJ has rubbed off on Andrew um, because EJ would come over to me you know Andrew's a hard worker you know and that really made us feel good that Andrew was a hard worker and um, and he would um, tell us about the bailing, gather all of the cardboards together and bail them, and that was his work program here while he was at SVA. And um, Andrew has come to appreciate uh, EJ, um, not just a boss at work, but more so as a grandparent, as a grandparent both EJ and Shelley, because he really didn't have a chance to know our parents, you know, as grandparents. So. We really appreciate EJ and Shirley for all that you have done for him. And uh, I know this will make a lasting impression on Andrew's life as well. And so on behalf of my wife and my family, we just want to share our condolences. May God be with you and comfort you. Thank you. I am thankful that EJ and Shirley were here I moved down here to, to Virginia from Michigan, had a lot of turmoil in my family, but they was able to make, my boys made friends with them, and they just sort of took them in and helped them, and I appreciate that. And I worked with EJ, and he also helped me when I had to go out and visit my brother. He drove truck and delivered pallets for me while I was gone with my son, Mike. I just thank you. It's been a blessing to know EJ. The Lord be with us all. I don't know if um, the rest of you men, <clears throat> men in here had the same experience I did, but I remember the first time that EJ met me till the last time I shook his hand, the handshake was, so you think you're a man too. <laughs> it was, that's the way he shook your hand. And so his hands were, uh, I don't know if it was just a thing with me or he did the rest with you guys too, but he always gave me that extra squeeze and sometimes we kind of competed with each other to see who could hold on the longest. And you couldn't beat him. You couldn't beat him. He's, he's a tough guy. But ever since the first time I met him, uh, he, his interaction with me, I, and I remember it distinctly, uh, when he first met me, it, it was like as if he already knew me. That's how jolly and friendly he was. So I'll never, never forget his smile that went, you know, almost from ear to ear. A man that was just full of uh, Christ uh, characteristics, uh, big time. Um, Mechanically inclined, my lands. That man could get more of it, more out of a Geo Metro than, you know, his Geo Metro was tougher than any Ford pickup out there, and uh, he just there was nothing broken with him. He he could fix fix anything. So 
just an amazing, amazing man. When you meet someone like that, that you know, I know we, we suffer the loss, but when you see someone pass away with, with those distinct characteristics that Jesus has created in your character, it, it's just a hope for all of us in what Jesus can do for us. Uh, Norbert and I did not plan this, but I want to talk about the handshake too. The first time I shook EJ's hand, it's an experience if you've never had, you don't want it. <laughs> he had a vice-like grip, and I told him one Sabbath, every, every Sabbath I would pass him as he sat just about right here, and he would hold out his hand and I would shake it, and I think he took special delight in watching me grimace. <laughs> and finally one day I said, EJ, I love you. I love shaking your hand, but I'm going to teach you a different handshake. And he was intrigued. I says, I want to teach you the ghetto handshake. If you're familiar with that, it's not painful. It's a friendly kind of gesture that blacks use, and I learned it at Tacoma Academy. And from then on, EJ and I shared a ghetto handshake just about every Sabbath. Uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, getting my CDL for um, driving the factory truck for SVA, and EJ was one of the two guys that took me out to help me get my CDL, and we had a great time together. And then, <clears throat> here in the last um, few years, uh, we had to move the mission sale from the old box factory over to the bindery, and. Uh, EJ and Shirley were doing the cardboard there, and I, I think I kind of became a thorn in their flesh. But he never, he never, um, you know, re revealed that. He was always kind, and uh, because we just had all kinds of stuff coming in that was cluttering their workspace, and I felt bad about it. Uh, but he was always um, kind about it, and uh, we're gonna, we're gonna miss him. Uh, my name is Bassam. Um, I worked with only I only worked with EJ and Shirley for six months, but um, they were the best. Um, he really taught me what hard work was, and he taught me so many things. And he was really every time I gave him a handshake, he was he was so full of life. He really he really impacted my life personally. And I love EJ and Shirley so much. And I can't wait to see EJ in heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for both of them. And I will never forget him. I'll never forget him. Thank you. Is there one more person that would like to share? Thank you, Bassam. I sat in um, EJ Sabbath School class, um, and I have um, I had a difficult time, um, you know, feeling accepted <laughs> sometimes. And I'm just so thankful that Shirley and EJ were so accepting of us in our Sabbath school class. And E.J. was so proud of the fact that he had finished reading, that he was reading and finished reading the Clear Word Bible, and that he was starting again. And um, he inspired me to start, too. So I'm very thankful for their friendship. Amen. Uh, 
I met the Laughlins a long time ago when we were in college, and I came down here with Kenny. We weren't really, you know that stage when you're not really dating, but you're kind of friends? Anybody know that, recognize that idea? Okay. And uh, at that time, Jamie was about 16 or so, and, and Dad was fixing up a car for Jamie. And I, I was joking with him one night, you know, and I said, you know, you should, you should fix me up a car. You know, I'd like you to fix me up a car. And he said, I only do that for family members. You'll have to talk to Kenny. <laughs> so. I'm assuming he fixed the car for you. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll have some other time in the fellowship hall to share with the family, but we appreciate so much your your memories and your words of encouragement and support. And um, we're going to just switch the program just a little bit, and at this time we're going to view the slides. <laughs> 